Lord, we thank you for the breath that's in our lungs, and you've told us in your word that that comes from you. And so, Lord, we thank you. We're grateful for the opportunity to meet together, to be with our brothers and sisters, Lord, to remember your word and to hear it, to sing your praise, Lord, to uh, turn our hearts to you. And Lord, we just ask for your presence with us. We ask for your leading and your prompting. Jesus, we are only here because of you, and we come today through you and through your grace. We thank you again, Jesus, that you laid down your life for us, and we've been bought at the price of your very blood, and we are um, grateful for that. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fill us today, and we know that lasting and eternal life comes to us through you. We're grateful for that. Thank you that you lead us in the word, and you bring back to our remembrance everything Jesus has given to us, and you take us deeper in that truth. And we pray that you would lead us in our time of worship together today. We pray all of this in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Let's hear God's word together. These are words you've probably heard a lot. This is in Hebrews chapter 10, a few verses there. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, because we have all of those things, here's what the scriptures say we can do. Let us draw near with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The Lord is the one who has promised, and he is faithful, and we're here in him today. Would you stand with us, and let's join our hearts and sing together.
Amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Am I on? Is it me? It was me. Wow. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to see you. You made it. You set your clocks forward and you made it. Because if you didn't set your clock forward, you didn't make it. So it's so good that you made it. I know you're dragging. I know I am. We'll fake it till we make it. So it's, it's good to see you guys this morning. It's a blessing to be here. Thank you, Praise Team, for getting us started this morning. A couple quick things to make you aware of. Um, first, I'm excited to make you aware of a food drive. We've done these on a regular basis um, throughout the year, and it's supporting the Southeast Gwinnett Co-op, which is one of our ministry partners. So in a couple of weeks, two Saturdays from yesterday, uh, we gather all of our groceries that we want to give, we, we load up the trailer, and ultimately we get those to the Southeast Gwinnett Co-op to support families in our community. And the, here's the good news, the more that participate, the more families we get to support. And so this is a huge opportunity, and we're going to piggyback this opportunity was something related to Easter. So you're going to get more information about the food drive through our announcements over the next couple of weeks. But Easter is coming. It is three weeks away. And it's always a great day to be together. We will be outside at 1030, weather permitting. And uh, again, just an incredible opportunity. Hey, Kathy, come here a second. I need you to help me with something. Okay. All right, so I have a question. Okay. All right. This is the question. Hopefully everybody can see this. I'm too tall. I'm in the way sometimes, so I'm going to stand over here. So, Kathy, what is the most effective way, you can see it right there, to motivate someone to attend church on Easter? So here's the first question, okay. or the first option. Ready? Make them feel guilty for not going to church. That's, what do you think? Well, I mean, that's an option. It's an option? Yeah, okay. Not the best option. Not the best. Okay. You, you, not yeah. the best option. Not the best option. Okay. okay. COVID, uh, you know, convince them it's a great opportunity to get out of the house. What do you that think? It is true. I mean. It'll probably be nice. It'll be outside. Right. It'll be COVID friendly. Right. COVID friendly. Maybe not the best. <laughs> Third option. Okay. This one might be a winner. Uh, donuts, donuts, donuts. It's true. Donut King is very popular. Right, y'all? Right? Uh, donuts? Uh, no, I'm not. Not gonna, the best I'm one. Not okay. Go with that then you always have the all of the above or none of the above. What do you think about all of those options? What would you be your top choice? No. I'm going to go with none of the above. None of the above. Great answer. Good yeah. job, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, for helping. The number one answer, the best answer to the most effective way is to invite someone to come with you, okay? And so in your seats this morning are cards, and we're going to have other opportunities and ways to equip you to invite someone to join you for Easter. You have next-door neighbors. You have people down the street. You have coworkers and friends, family invite them to join you. It's outside. It's COVID friendly. It's all those things. Sorry, I didn't keep my distance. Um, I want to encourage you, start right now inviting those people to join you for Easter. Okay? All right. We're giving you the tools. The tools are right there. Take a picture of that card. Use it to text someone. It's two-sided. The information is all there. And that's the best way that we can invite some, to, to have someone join us. Thank you again, is by inviting them. All right? So uh, praise team. Thank you so much for getting here. I got here early this morning, and there are so many people that come early to prepare this opportunity for us to praise the Lord. There are so many people that serve. Thank you so to all of you who do that. Thank you for putting, putting the extra energy and effort to bringing this together. Praise team, lead us. So I'm a teacher, and to see those multiple choice options, I may have made tests that way, all of the above, none of the above, and possibly option A and C, but not B, <laughs> right? So, And COVID-friendly, does that mean friendly for us or friendly for the COVID virus? <laughs> I think maybe we need to work that out. Yeah, yeah. The Lord is good to us in so many different ways, so many different ways. And one of, the, one of the ways it's so good for us to remember on a regular basis is the Lord's mercy to us. The fact that the Lord has spared us and he's treated us with compassion even when we are in our sins, right? As it says in Romans, that's when the Lord loved us is when we were still in sin, we were still dead. And that's the point at which God loved us. And to think about the Lord's mercy is never ending, and we have that in abundance, and it never ends. And so we're receiving something that we do not deserve, and there's no end to it. What a remarkable gift. What a remarkable gift. Our sins are many, the Lord's mercy is more. Let's stand together and sing that to God's praise.
invite you to go ahead and take a seat. Jeff Sissel is going to come up. We have today a, a very special guest with us, and Jeff's going to introduce him. Pete, great to have you with us. Good morning. Uh, we have here today a guest, Pete Frank, his wonderful wife, Sunny, in the back there. Uh, a very short introduction, very short. I hope that uh, you elaborate on this story a little bit. Um, it depends on the story. Well, hopefully I'll get it right, but um, Pete and Sonny go all the way back to, uh, um, I guess, meeting Steve and Donna. Mm -hmm. um, they came to town with Life Action Ministries. Sonny uh, has a, a, a beauty salon, a hair salon. She does. She does my hair. <laughs> yeah, she does. I was going to ask about that. Uh, go ahead. But, uh, um, Graciously invited uh, the Life Action Group, maybe Steve and Donna, for haircuts, mm -hmm. and uh, that became lunch, and that became ultimately uh, pulling uh, Pete and Sonny into the ministry. Uh, yeah. They were looking for uh, for a ministry connection, I think, and that was uh, the Lord's uh, yeah. timing, and it was just perfect. And uh, I think uh, nearly about ten years in Life Action. Uh, about two years in Life Action. About two years yeah. in Life Action. So. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Close. Uh, <laughs> I thought I had that. Uh, yeah. But uh, then along came Gospel Link, and you're going to learn all about Gospel Link here this morning. Uh, Pete and Sonny have actually came here also about 10 years ago, right? Yes. So this is a second <laughs> visit, uh, and we're, it's just great to have you. It's great to so be here. Thank let you. Me, let me pray for you, and then we'll uh, get started. Heavenly Father, it's just great to be uh, in this house with you, and we're so thankful that you've brought... Uh, uh, Pete and Sonny here both today, and for Pete, Lord, we just uh, cry out to you to magnify your words in his voice today, and let us hear from you, um, and that uh, your name would be raised uh, as higher than high, and we give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's great to be back with you. You know, I, as Jeff said, I, we were here about uh, about 10, maybe 11 years ago, and um, I did such a good job, they invited me back 10 years later, so um, it is really good to be with you this morning, and uh, my wife is, is here as well, Sunny, and uh, she, I don't get to have her with me that often when I travel and speak, but uh, we wanted to come together to Anchor Church, and so it's great to have her with me. I want to introduce to you real quickly, um, by way of picture here, our family, and I'm not going to take the time to uh, talk about each of these individuals, but to suffice it to say that we have uh, six children, our two youngest ones we adopted from Vietnam uh, almost 15 years ago now. They're on the, the bookends there in the picture. And uh, we have six kids, though. We have three daughter-in-laws, uh, soon-to-be son-in-law, uh, four grandchildren, and one of those is to be born in early May, Lord willing. And that makes Grammy real happy, real, real happy. And when Grammy's happy, Papa's happy. So uh, I do want to show you a quick picture here. This was about 25 years ago. You may have seen this on Facebook or wherever, um, a tribute to Steve and Donna. But uh, yeah, that was us 25 years ago. And that was after an anchor uh, service when you guys used to meet. How many of you were here at anchor when you met at the school all those years ago? And this was there. Shortly, I think, after Anchor was launched, and we were on vacation and stopped for a service and uh, spent some time. And so, as Jeff said, Steve, Pastor Steve and Donna have had just an incredible impact uh, on our lives, and we are so, so thankful for them and for this church. It's a good church. It's a great church. And so, glory to God. Amen. Um, I have the privilege of representing a ministry called Gospel Link, and our vision is advancing the gospel through native missionaries. And uh, I trust that what I have to share this morning will be an encouragement to you and also a challenge to you on a personal level. The title of my message this morning is Reaching the Back Row. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Lord, it's already been so good to be in your house this morning. And the song, all the songs, but the one that just really pierced me was, though our sins were many, her mercy was greater. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for salvation you offer us through Jesus Christ. Lord, if there be one or if there be many here this morning who have never repented of their sin and put their faith in him and him alone, 
Lord, may today be the day of their salvation. Lord, I think of that verse in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. It says, look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And Lord, we acknowledge that this morning. You are God, there's no one else. And so we look to you for all of our needs today. And Lord, our, our needs vary here in this assembly today, but my prayer is that you would meet us at our point of need, wherever we're at here in this building. May your spirit give us the grace to obey what you'd have us to do. And Lord, uh, just be with us now, we pray, and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. William Carey once said, or I'm sorry, C.S. Lewis once said what's on the screen, a Christian's faith is always personal, but never private. Our faith is always personal to us, but never private. Now turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at what is hopefully a familiar passage to you. Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, known as the Great Commission. And as we're turning there, I want to remind you that Jesus in his divine prerogative could have chosen to fulfill this Great Commission by himself. As we talked about in a wonderful Sunday school class this morning, God is the eternally existent Jehovah God of all creation. He spoke the world and he spoke the universe into existence, right? With the, by the breath of his mouth, the stars were formed. And Colossians 1 tells us that Jesus is currently sustaining all things. He's literally holding all things together. Now, that's a pretty big thing. And Jesus could have fulfilled this great commission completely on his own. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. But his plan is to include us. That's a pretty cool plan on our part, isn't it? Disciples making disciples. In fact, in Matthew 4, 19, one of Jesus' first commands that he gave to his disciples was, follow me and I will make you to become what? That's right, fishers of men. In other words, you're going to be making disciples as you're following him. Discipleship and missions uh, grows out of, of, of discipleship, following Christ. We'll be making other disciples. We know that disciple making begins with justification. It begins with the good news of the gospel, right? That Jesus suffered and died on a cross to pay a sin debt for you and for me that we could never pay as the holy, sinless Son of God. He was buried in that grave and on the third day rose again, which we'll celebrate soon at Easter. And he's currently seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus paid the cost for us. And though our sins were many, his mercy was certainly greater. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All authority, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Three points I want to share with you this morning. Number one is the priority of the Great Commission. This is the priority, church. I know hopefully it's your priority. It certainly is mine. These were Jesus' final words that he gave to us. And we could look over to Acts chapter 1 and, uh, and find there where uh, Jesus tells the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Remember that? To the uttermost parts of the earth. And then what happened to Jesus? He ascended to the right hand of the Father. This was the final command that he left with us, us his final words here on this earth. And the final words that a person utters on this earth indicates what's a priority to them, what they're passionate about. For example, P.T. Barnum of Barnum and Bailey Circus, his final words were, how were the receipts today at Madison Square Garden? <laughs> Evidently, ticket sales was a big deal to him. Money was a priority to him. It's a reminder to us this morning, it's a reminder to me that this is God's priority, disciple making, making his glory known to the nations, making the gospel known to those who have yet to hear the gospel. And we know this great commission is not only found here in Matthew 28, it's also, also in Matt, uh, Mark 16, 15. He said, preach the gospel to all creation. Luke 24, 47 says, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. Also in John 20, 21, as the Father sent me, Jesus said, so I'm sending you. And then as the, I referenced earlier, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, about us being his witnesses. 
You know, church, if God says something once, it should get our attention. Amen? Amen. We need to heed the seriousness of God's word. But when he says it five times, and really it's a theme throughout all of Scripture, that we are his witnesses to declare his glory among the nations. But when he repeatedly says this, it's, it should, wow, you know, we better heed. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, once said that the Great Commission is not an option for us to consider. It's a command for us to obey. Taking the gospel, starting with our neighbors right here in our Jerusalem, and extending through missions endeavors to the uttermost parts of the world. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our neighbors here, people across the seas, people like these in Cambodia need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. This little girl in Vietnam needs to know that Buddha will not save her. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven. That pretty much covers all names, right? No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Every knee will bow, either in worship one day or in judgment one day. John 4, 35, Jesus said, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. The priority of the Great Commission. That verse always intrigues me when I read it because the implication is that our eyes are on other things. He says, lift up your eyes. Get our eyes, our focus off of the temporary onto the eternal, to what's really important. You know, secular companies can be very passionate about getting their product out to as many people as possible. I'll give you an example. Coca-Cola, based where? In Atlanta, Georgia, right? Coca-Cola, many years ago, had a very simple mission statement. It said this, a can of Coke in the hand of everyone on the face of the earth by the year 2000. That was Coke's mission statement many years ago. Now, has Coca-Cola been at least somewhat successful in completing their mission statement? They have been. If you've traveled... Anywhere, you'll, you find out that it's, it's hard to go anywhere and not have access to a Coca-Cola. The first time I was in Africa, I just joined Gospel Inc. almost 14 years ago and had stepped out of pastoral ministry and, and uh, joined Gospel Inc. And, and immediately went to Africa. And I was there with another Gospel Inc. representative, Willie Hunter. Willie had been to Africa many times doing missions work. It was my first time to be on the continent of Africa. Well, we were in southern Africa in the country of Mozambique. And one of our objectives in Mozambique was to go out and preach the gospel to the local people there and also meet with some prospective gospel link church planters. And so Willie and I rode in a van. Our driver drove us off of the paved tarmac onto a dirt road. And we drove and we drove, zigzagged out into the bush of Mozambique for about two hours. When we finally got to our destination, it was pitch dark. They pulled over, they stopped, and they took us to what would be our lodging for the next couple nights. It was a little mud hut with a thatched roof there in the bush of Mozambique, Africa. And we ducked and went into this little hut, and there was a candle burning there to welcome us. It was like Motel 6. They left the light on for us. <laughs> By the way, Kathy, are you available if I need help with the multiple choice thing in my <laughs> slideshow? Okay, great. That's good to know. That was good. So Willie and I ducked and went into this little hut. And we're sitting there and enjoying the moment. And you know what they brought out and offered to us as a welcoming gift that night? If we can go to the next slide, that would be good. Because you'll find out what they brought out. (laughs) They brought out... We got Coke that night. (laughs) Bottles of Coca-Cola. I'll show you the picture in a minute. Warm Coca-Cola, by the way. But we're sitting there in that little hut, and I said to Willie, Willie, we've got, we've got to take a picture of this. This was crazy. We're, I have no idea where we're at. And seriously, there is Coca-Cola. And I thought to myself later, you know, if a soft drink company can be so committed to a simple mission statement, how much more committed should I be to my Lord's great commission of taking the good news of the gospel to those who desperately 
need it, the priority of the Great Commission. Secondly is the people of the Great Commission. The people of the Great Commission. Now you notice there in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, go and teach all nations. If you've studied this passage, you'll find that the, the word nations is the Greek word ethne. We get the word, there's the picture of the Coca-Cola's in the mud hut, by the way. We get the word ethnic from that word, ethnic. So I believe what the Lord is talking about here is he's talking about not just the 200 or so people groups, I'm sorry, nations, countries in the world, but all of the people groups within those nations, the ethnic minority groups. People groups is defined by things like, listen, race, culture, language, etc. For example, did you know that in India alone, there's over 2,300 people groups in India? In the nation of Vietnam, where we adopted two daughters from, there's 54 different ethne, ethnic minority people groups in the nation of Vietnam. You know, it's a reminder to us this morning, the gospel is good news. Amen, church? It's good news, not just for us here in America, but for all the people groups in all of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Look to me and be saved ends of the earth, it says in Isaiah. The ends of the earth be saved. That's our desire. That's our heart. I trust that's your heart as well. You know, Proverbs 25, 25 says, as cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. I want to share with you some good news from the mission field this morning. These countries aren't all countries that Gospel Link works in, but God is building his church around the world in places like China, communist China. Voice of the Martyrs estimates there may be as many as 100 million Christians today in communist China. Incredible. The church is growing. The church is persecuted there. But what does persecution bring? Well, it brings purification and also growth, typically. The church is growing in China. Places like Iran. How many of you remember the hostage crisis back in the late 70s? Okay, I see some hands. That dates us because that was way back. But in 1979, the Ayatollah vowed to crush Christianity in Iran. At that time, there was about 500 Christians in the whole nation. Since then, God has been drawing Muslims by the thousands to himself. Today, there's over one million believers in the nation of Iran. Books are being written about the growth of the church in Iran. The Ayatollah didn't understand that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Isn't it just, I guess, ironic that the church, the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran where the Ayatollah said, we're going to crush it out. Incredible. What about Nepal? Let's think about Nepal, pretty uttermost part of the earth. The first church was established in the nation of Nepal, 1952. There were 29 believers in that first church in Nepal. Today, there's over 800,000 Christians in Nepal. Church is exploding there in Nepal. Glory to God. Amen, church. I hope that encourages you. And I could share a lot more of places around the world where the church is growing. Gospel Link's vision and passion is making disciples, planting churches in third world nations. Churches like this one in, uh, in Zambia, I had the privilege of helping plant that church many years ago. Churches like these in the communist nation of Vietnam. I oversee Vietnam and Cambodia for the ministry of gospel Inc. Vietnam is a communist nation still. It's a 1040 window country. If you know anything about missions, typically or basically that means that it's a very unreached nation in the world, and yet the church is growing in Vietnam. Pray for Vietnam, please. Uh, God is drawing people to himself. Certainly there are obstacles to the gospel there that are entrenched in the hearts and minds of, of people, but the church is growing. I just want to share with you some pictures of ministry activity by gospel preachers there in Vietnam. Children are being saved. Elderly people are being saved. The woman's name in the pink there is Mrs. Fung, 84-year-old devout Buddhist. The man in the white, his name is Nguyen Yu. He's a gospel preacher in Vietnam. Let me share with you her story. Nguyen Yu and his outreach team from his church went to Mrs. Fung's village one day and just went house to house sharing the gospel with the people there in her village. They came to Mrs. Fung's house, the devout Buddhist. All of her children and grandchildren live with her, which is common in that culture. 
And so they began sharing the gospel with her and her family. Well, Mrs. Fung instantly realized what they were doing. So his report says she began going around the house loudly saying, glory to Buddha, glory to Buddha, real loudly just trying to interrupt what they were doing. Well, they went on with sharing the gospel, sharing about Jesus Christ and how to be saved. When they were finished, all of her family members repented of their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ. That's good news from a far country. But they left that day with a burden in their hearts for Mrs. Foon. And so about two weeks later, he says, after much prayer, they went back to Mrs. Foon's village. And they went directly to her house. And he says that she welcomed them with a warm handshake. So they wondered, what is going on with Mrs. Foon? And she says, I'm so glad that you've come back. I wanted to thank you for sharing with my children and grandchildren what you believe because they've been like different people since you were here. She says, they treat me now with more love and respect than they ever have before. That's the transforming power of the gospel. And so they took the opportunity to share Christ with Mrs. Foon. This time she listened intently. And when they were finished, she bowed her head, turned from her sin and her idolatry, and put her faith in Jesus Christ. And she said, uh, before they, they were preparing to leave, and she said before they left, she said, would you and your men take down these Buddhist idols and wall hangings out of my home? There's a picture of some of the men taking down those Buddhist wall hangings. His report says it took them nearly two hours to remove all that stuff. And this time she was going around the house and she was saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Because now she's a worshiper of the one true and living God. The transforming power of the gospel. This is a former Buddhist monk being baptized in a rice paddy in Vietnam. Pastor Dang Toy, he's got an incredible testimony. He's a former police officer for the Vietnamese government. He used to arrest Christians, put them in prison, and confiscate their Bibles. He would take those Bibles home with him. Now, what do you think he began doing with the Bible? Yeah, we know, right? God works in mysterious ways sometimes, and he began reading the Bible. And the next time I was in Vietnam, I had to ask him face to face through our interpreter. I said, Why did you begin reading the Bible? I mean, here's a communist, atheistic, God-denying, hard-hearted, pagan, basically, he begins reading the Bible. He looked at me and he said this. He said, because of the courage that I saw in the Christians that I was arresting, he said, I had to find out what makes these people so brave in the face of persecution and even imprisonment. What a testimony of our brothers and sisters in Christ halfway around the world standing strong in their faith in the face of imprisonment in Vietnam. And that impacted this man's life. And he began reading God's word, seeking the truth. We know that if you seek God with all your heart, you'll find him. That's exactly what happened to Dang Toy. He came to Christ, was trained, and began preaching the gospel, planting churches there in Vietnam, baptizing people. Like, How do you like to be baptized in a barrel? may never get out of there, right? Great story. Glory to God. 23 new Christians prepared for baptism there in rural Vietnam. This is a group of Hmong people that are being led to the Lord. The pastor is the one on the cap there. And, uh, you know, the Hmong tribal group, as late as 1988, that's one of those ethnic groups in Vietnam, as late as 1988, there were no believers amongst the Hmong tribal people. Today, there's over 400,000 Christians amongst them all. That's encouraging. God is growing his church in places around the world. Now, listen, there's some bad news we have to get to before we go to the final point. The bad news is that nearly 3 billion people have yet to hear the gospel for the first time. Nearly 3 billion. Now, listen, how do we get our minds wrapped around a statistic like that? You know, as missionaries, we like to share statistics. That's our spiritual gift, right? Sharing statistics. And uh, let me put a face to that 3 billion number. This is a little 12-year-old girl that our missions team encountered in Vietnam several years ago on a missions trip. And uh, we were driving from Saigon to Cambodia to a rural house church, and our van driver pulled us over after a couple hours into the trip just for a little roadside pit stop and uh, coffee shack kind of a thing in rural Vietnam. And our tall, you know, American team piles out of our our van there, and uh, this little girl meanders out of the coffee shop, curiously checking out our team, 
And Amy, one of our translators, got down one in, on one knee, and she uh, began to draw this little girl out. And Amy, I remember as if it were yesterday, Amy turned to me and she said, Pete, this little girl has never heard the name of Jesus. And we know that there are people around the world who are unreached, never heard the name of Jesus. And I just thought, Lord, this precious little girl. I thought, how many more are there just in Vietnam who have never heard the name? If they've never heard the name, how then shall they be saved, as Paul says? Amy took the opportunity. She took about 15 minutes there just to real concisely try to share the gospel with this little girl, and she gladly prayed with Amy. But she's kind of become the poster child, if you will, for the unreached. And I just look at her, and I think, Lord, may all the ends of the earth be saved. Theologian Carl F. Henry once said, the gospel's only good news if it gets there in time. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, remember this verse? He said, the harvest is plentiful, laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. You know, all of us can do that. Maybe we can't go. Maybe God hasn't called us to Vietnam. Maybe we can't give much. Man, we can all pray. And it's interesting, that verse where Jesus says, pray earnestly, it means to beg God. There's a, there's a note there, there. It denotes desperation, that we're to pray earnestly. Lord, please send people. Please send your messengers to the harvest fields to reach people like this. And why the desperation? The desperation is because people are a heartbeat away from eternity. So I want to challenge you, encourage you to pray that God will send forth Laborers. You know what? When we really pray that sincerely, we can't help but put ourselves at God's disposal, right? At the Lord's disposal. Like Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. Send me to my neighbor. Lord, reach my neighbor. Send a labor. Here I, <laughs> here I am, Lord. Uh, send me. You know, we're blessed to live in America. And just quickly before I go to the final point, we are blessed to live in America. That's a good place for an amen. We're blessed to live in America. Thank you. That's good. Aren't you thankful for the gospel, the access that we have to the gospel here in America? Aren't you thankful for the freedom that we have in this nation to assemble without fear of persecution? We're blessed financially. Relatively speaking, we're a wealthy people. Listen, if, if you make $25,000 a year, you make more than 90% of the world's population. If you make $50,000 a year, you make more than 99% of the world's population. God has blessed us. And I don't know why, but in Acts chapter 17, verse 26, it says that God is sovereign even over demographics. In other words, he's put us here in this place at this time for purpose. I like to illustrate it this way. In John chapter 6 is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. You remember that account? And Jesus has the people sit down in an orderly fashion. The disciples come with their baskets, and he fills them with fish and loaves. Let's imagine this scenario. It didn't happen this way. Let's imagine if it had happened this way. Because I liken it to how it is in the world today, living in America as opposed in contrast to the rest of the world. Let's, let's imagine the disciples begin going down to distribute the fish and loaves. And they pass the baskets down row one. They pass the baskets down row two. Let's say the baskets run out. And so they bring them back to the Lord of all creation. He fills the baskets, the baskets again with fish and loaves. Let's say they don't go to row three. They go back down to row one. Would you like seconds? Would any, would you like, nod your heads for me, will you? Okay, good, good, good. Seconds. Their baskets run out. Again, and Jesus fills them again. And lo and behold, they don't go to row three. Sorry, Matt. They're going to go back down to row one. Would you like thirds? Anybody like thirds? If that's how it had been, what do you think the people in the back row would have done? What would have you done? Probably moved to the front rows, right? <laughs> or at least stood up and said, hey, Jesus, send your men back here with some of that bread. We're hungry too. Now, I don't know why God has sovereignly, graciously chosen 
to put me smack dab in the middle of the front row here in America, but it's just easy to forget that there are people in the back rows who have yet to hear the gospel. They've not had the bread of life passed back to them. There's three billion of them back there. So what can I do to help pass some of that bread back to the back rows? I want to just take a few minutes as we wrap up this morning and go to the final point here, but Gospel Link is a ministry that is all about linking Christians in America to the church in third world countries to help pass that bread, some of that resource and relationship to those on the back rows. Our, our model as a missions organization is working through native missionaries, national preachers. In other words, men that are planting churches in their home countries. By the way, we're nationals right here in America. We're native missionaries <laughs> to our fellow Americans here. But working through training and assisting native missionaries who are reaching their own people They were born and raised in the country where they're planting churches. The final point this morning is the partnership in the Great Commission. The partnership. How can you reach your world? Would you consider partnering with a native missionary? And I'd like to put this disclaimer, if you will, out there. Uh, This is in no way to compete with the giving to your church here at Anchor and the ministries that your church is involved in. But I'm going to share with you a, a missions model that doesn't take a lot of resource to really have great leverage on the mission field. Consider partnering with a native missionary through your prayer support and through your financial support. Now, all of you have a brochure there, I believe, that was uh, in the pews, in the chairs. So if you take that out, I want to refer to that just briefly. This brochure tells you more about Gospel Inc. You can get on our website, gospelinc.org, and find out a whole lot more than what's in here. But basically, it's an overview of um, accountability and how we choose our native missionaries, etc. But But on the back is a response form, which, which we'll get to in a minute. Listen, we're currently partnering with close to 1,300 Native missionaries in 14 different third world nations. We're very thankful for the growth that God has given our ministry and the results that we're seeing on the mission field. All of these Native missionaries, we seek to raise $200 a month for in support that fully sponsors them, $200 a month. What does this support provide? Well, on the screen, I'm not going to read it for you. You can read it yourself. Several things that this $200 a month provides for these native missionaries. Um, In short, it provides gospel leverage in a third world nation. It doesn't take a lot of U.S. dollar to have great impact on the mission field in some of these places. Now, you say, well, I can't give $200 a month. And we understand that. So for as little as $20 a month, you can help support a native missionary. Anywhere between $20 and $200 a month will help sponsor a native missionary. It's a fraction, roughly about 5% of what it costs to send a traditional U.S. missionary to the field. We still believe in sending U.S. missionaries to the field, but this is a model that's a great complement to that traditional mission strategy. Who can sponsor a native missionary? This list gives you some ideas. Most of our sponsors are uh, individuals and families like you all over America that have linked some of their resources to the church in third world countries. Real quickly, five advantages of working through native missionaries. One is the citizenship advantage. All of our native missionaries are nationals. They're born and raised in their country. They don't have to get a passport. They don't have to renew their visas. Uh, This is our Gospel Link national director in Cambodia. Sim Mien, his wife Sharon, their two children, great family. Uh, He administers Gospel Inc. along with the leadership team there in Cambodia. And he's a citizen of Cambodia. This is him preaching at a VBS there in rural Cambodia. A second advantage is the cultural advantage. How many of you have ever been to a foreign country? Would you raise your hand? Yeah, you go to some of these places. Wow, that's almost everybody. That's incredible. How many of you have been on a short-term missions trip? That is impressive. It really is. Praise God for that. I'm a big believer in short-term mission trips. They're life-changing. And the investment in a short-term mission trip typically yields a whole lot more uh, yield down the road and for a lifetime. But you go to some of these countries, and things are very different. Kids, you'll like these pictures. Housing in Africa is very different than here in America. Showers in Mozambique. When you're tall, it's a real uh, (laughs) awkward thing to shower in one of those. Insects in Vietnam, like this live scorpion, very different than here in the United States. 
um, modes of transportation, different street scenes. Uh, that's not Atlanta, but I tell you, the traffic looks about that crowded uh, around Atlanta. Uh, that's Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon, the city of motorbikes. Uh, food is different. That's a, a bowl of raw squid that was served to my son Trey and me when we were on a mission trip several years ago in Vietnam. And this picture shows what Trey thought of that <laughs> raw squid. That's culture shock right there. And, uh, but, you know, nationals, native missionaries, they're used to that culture. They like that food. It's a big advantage they have over U.S. missionaries. Then they have the linguistic advantage. They don't have to learn the language. They were raised speaking that language. They have a time advantage, and we've talked a little bit about the economic advantage. This is a group of our national preachers in Zambia, Africa, at the Bible College that Gospel Inc. has in Zambia. It's Ambassador International University. Uh, but these Zambian church planters all have sponsors in America that pray for them, support them, um, receive reports from them every quarter. And by the way, I'm the back on the right, if you can't tell. <laughs> the big picture is that Gospel Link started uh, 22 years ago, almost 23, with one preacher in Africa. And today, by God's grace, we've grown uh, to serve in 14 different nations. So some ways to respond. If you look at your uh, response form... Uh, the first way uh, is to go on a short-term missions trip. This is not actually in your response form. Uh, we'll get to this in a minute. But if you'd like to go on a trip with us, uh, my wife and I lead teams typically yearly to Southeast Asia. And uh, it'd be a really, really cool missions trip for you to take part in. We do orphanage work. Uh, we do a conference with our na national preachers there, sometimes their wives. A lot of great things involved uh, in a short-term mission trip. So just see me at the table uh, out back after the service. And then church referral. Now, on your response form at the bottom, this is a great way that you can help get, um, you know, be a spokesperson for the unreached. At the bottom of your response form, if you would put in a church, I mean, I'd like for all of you to do this. Everybody knows of a church. And if you'd like to receive our newsletter and correspondence, put your information at the top. If you'd like to refer me to a church, put it on the bottom there. I'd be glad to contact the pastor, introduce myself, and ask if I can come and, and uh, really you know, advocate for the unreached. And so that's a great way for you to help. It uh, doesn't matter if the church is here in Georgia or anywhere in the United States. And then the final way that you can help is on the screen and also on your response form. Certainly no pressure here, but uh, it would be such a blessing to, to get some partnership for some of these preachers that are on my table out there that need support. Uh, such as this one in Vietnam, just newly approved. And he has zero right now, and uh, so he needs the full amount. But there are others out there. Uh, one in India, I know, needs just $20 a month. Uh, and there's different levels of need represented on my table. But those are the countries that we work in, and uh, just thankful for what God is doing in all those nations. By the way, Georgia there is not the state of Georgia. It's the nation of Georgia. All right, just to clarify that. Uh, on the screen is what sponsors receive every three months. I want to close with a story. Uh, this is a gospel preacher in Vietnam, and his name is Mang Nia. And that's his family and a motorbike that was provided by a donor here in America. Motorbikes are very, very valuable tools in places like Vietnam because they can navigate the rugged terrain and they get the gospel out to rural areas a whole lot faster than on foot. And so let me just read to you a, a quick excerpt from one, one of his outreach reports. Uh, he says this, One day as I was traveling home from my son's school, I saw a man lying on the sidewalk with his hand in the air as if he needed something. So here's the scene. You've got a busy street in Vietnam, and Mang Nia sees a man laying on the sidewalk. He's got his hand up like he's in need. Nobody's stopping. People are just driving by, kind of like, the story of the Good Samaritan, in a way. No one will stop. Well, Magnia says this, I stopped my motorbike and bought a bowl of rice soup for him. He was very sad and was surprised that I had stopped. I took him to his house. It was about three kilometers away. And upon arriving, all of his relatives left the house immediately. Now, we'll find out in a minute why that happened. He says, I found an old mat, and I laid it out for him to lay on. And then I told the man about Christ's love for him, and I shared the gospel. 
Before leaving, the man gave me his address. Three days later, the man came to my house to thank me, and he shared this with me out of his life. So this is the man who was laying on the sidewalk. He says this, when I went to Balak to work at a coffee plantation, my wife left me for another man and took my two children. He says, I was very sad and turned to alcohol. When I would get drunk, I would verbally abuse my relatives, even my parents. That's why his family fled the house that day when he came home. Even his parents didn't want to be around this man. He says, my life was eaten up with bitterness. I had no hope. But when you gave me the soup, I was encouraged by your kindness and wished I were you. So I would like to receive the Lord and become a member of your church. Amen. Praise the Lord. The man's name is Bobo Hong. That's him right there in the middle. That's the man that was laying on the sidewalk, the former drunkard. There's the preacher, Magnia. That's Bobo's father and mother. Bobo got saved that day. That's not the end of the story. Three weeks later, Bobo's parents invited me back to their house. They welcomed me in and wanted to know what kind of soup I fed to their son. <laughs> because his life had been changed since he ate the soup. He had given up alcohol and was no longer verbally abusive. The preacher says, I explained the gospel to them and told them it wasn't the soup, it was the power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, his parents and five siblings confess their sins and receive Christ as Lord and Savior. He and his family live in the Song Kandong district. Good news from a far country. You know, we don't know how God might use a simple act of compassion. Magnia pulled his motorbike over, took a little time with this man. That's a message for me. I have to take time with people if I'm going to have an impact on their lives for the gospel. A Christian in a third world country once said, Christians in America have watches, but they don't have time. He took a little time with this man. He didn't preach a message to him, but he bought him a bowl of rice soup. He was the hands and feet of Christ to this man in his point of need. And God translates that simple act of compassion into the salvation of an entire family. Good news from a far country. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your mercy is greater than all of our sin. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning because our sin is new every morning. Lord, we thank you that the gospel is transforming for time and for eternity. Our prayer is that, yes, all of this area, all of Georgia, all of the United States, and the uttermost parts of the earth the gospel message would go out loud and clear in a very dark and desperate world. I pray for Anchor Church, Lord, that you would guide and direct this church. Lord, provide the right pastoral leadership for this church. May this place continue to shine as a great lighthouse to the community here and beyond. Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pete, thank you so much for being with us today. Would you join me and thank Pete? <clears throat> Such a great reminder to be reminded of the power of God's word and the power of the gospel to actually transform and change lives and to hear of the work the Lord is doing around the world. Stephanie and I have, have supported a pastor through Gospel Link for about 13 years now. Highly recommend that to you. So if the Lord prompts you in that, would encourage you to do that. Um, the Lord multiplies Seed is planted, and then the Lord multiplies it, and that's the way the Lord works. There's a multiplying factor, and one generation tells the next, and the Lord grows his church that way, and he does that through his word. I'm going to invite you to stand with us. We're going to sing a song of response and open our hearts to the Lord, however he may want to use us for the gospel. So let's sing this together.
Tim's going to close us with an update in prayer. Good morning. Um, so just uh, another update on the pastoral search. So you guys remember Chris Gaither. Um, so Chris is, uh, put us on pause as far as the process, the, the visible external process with us um, several weeks ago. Um, some of you saw him in the service last week, and he and his family came down. And um, so they're continuing to process, right? They've got other opportunities in front of them to consider, and he's seeking the Lord uh, on direction. So please continue to, to pray for them. Um, we feel, we believe we need to keep moving um, with other candidates that we've talked to. So we're really excited to host next weekend uh, another candidate that we originally started talking with back in November. And David has continued to have conversations, you know, since we've had some of those initial conversations, a lot of questions back and forth. Um, not appropriate to give his name yet, but I'll tell you a little bit about his background. He has planted churches in the, in the Northeast. Uh, they served as missionaries in Uzbekistan for about 15 years. They've been back in the States for about five years, you know, working with various mission organizations. Um, so anyway, they'll be, they'll be visiting with us next weekend and uh, meeting, you know, a, a small circle of folks here, uh, mainly with the elders and staff at this point. And, um, you know, kind of see where it goes from there. David has continued to uh, interview different candidates. So I think there were three new resumes that came in. And David's had some initial conversations uh, with, with three other people just to kind of keep moving that along. So uh, we will have a family meeting on the 28th that we spoke about uh, previously. Uh, that'll be at 4 o'clock. Uh, that'll be another opportunity to, to have a little bit more in-depth Q&A on any questions or input you guys have on the pastoral search, uh, certainly feel free to approach uh, any of us, you know, between now and then uh, for that piece. Um, so thank you guys for continued prayers. Uh, many of you have encouraged us with that, and we, uh, we need that, and, and we'll take all of that we can get. Just a couple of opportunities you have for corporate prayer. Uh, Wednesday nights, so John and Lynn Hamilton and Ethan and Ariana head up a uh, Wednesday night prayer group from 7 to 8, so if you guys are able to make that, please do. They have online options uh, if you cannot make it in person. Uh, the bulletin comes out, prayer bulletin comes out every week, so I know you guys uh, hopefully get those emails, and there's PDFs, and there's also hard copies uh, usually available on Sunday morning, so just other ways to, to connect uh, with prayer. And then just to highlight a couple of critical uh, situations um, on the prayer list is Heidi Thomas and her family. So uh, I think we announced last week. Uh, so Heidi just found out a couple of weeks ago uh, that she has metastatic breast cancer. Uh, so um, Becca Thomas, who's our daughter, is down in Sarasota caring for her. So for those of you who didn't know Heidi, she attended here many years, known as a prayer warrior. Um, so please be in prayer for uh, Heidi and her family, and then Danny and Sheridan Phillips. Uh, so Danny is uh, on hospice, so please remember to keep them in your prayers. Um, so I'll close this in prayer now, and then we can be dismissed. Father, we, uh, we just praise you this morning. You are worthy, Lord. You're worthy of our lives. And, uh, Father, we want to live for you. Uh, we thank you for Pete and the message that he shared this morning, Father, uh, to see your work around the world. And, Father, we pray that you would set us on fire, Father, to uh, see people want to, to desire to see people come to know you, Father, um, in the nations, in our neighborhoods, in our community here, Father. Would you do a work in us that would give us that heart, that your priorities would be our priorities, Lord, that we would be shaped by your word and your spirit this week, and that you would be glorified in our midst, Lord. And we just lift all this up in your son's holy name. Amen. Hey, thank you again for allowing us into your home and your life today. We're glad that you've chosen to connect with us. And that message might have stirred something up in your heart. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. You know, today might be the most important day of your life. 
you might have chosen to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And we'd love to know that, and we'd love to give you resources and connect with you and help you in your walk with him. Here's how you can let us know how we can pray for you. Send us an email at prayerline at anchorholds.org. We'll get that email. We'll follow up with you. We'll give you whatever you need so that you can uh, gain answers and so you can grow in your relationship with Christ. He thanks again for being with us online today. Whether you join us again online or you join us in person, we look forward to seeing you again next week.